Uh, my name's Alison Hall, I'm 59 years old and I'm from Lee, Greater Manchester. that we knew that were in the crash were uh, Annie George, her stepdaughter Dorothy George and their friend Dorothy King. I knew them uh, because they, basically they were family friends, they knew um, my nana and, and my mum and that it was, it was more sort of like that side of the family really. Dorothy George uh, was, my, was my godmother. Well, prior to this, uh, in May 1970, uh, my great uncle had died, and he happened to be my godfather. Um, he was my mum's uncle, and they were, they were very close, and my mum was quite devastated. June 1970, uh, well, we always called her Nanny, that was my dad's mother. She collapsed and died. We went on holiday to Bournemouth in July 1970. Um, as we were to travel back, um, we had heard that there had been a plane crash in Spain. Thought, oh, how, how awful, never thought anything about it. Uh, Bournemouth is a long way from uh, Lee in Greater Manchester. Uh, we stayed overnight at a place called Furford, which is in Gloucestershire. The reason we stayed there is because there were, there's an RAF base there and there were some American planes coming in and we thought that we might see them. When we arrived at this little place, it was a sort of pub hotel, my mum went to ring my nana and I always remember my sister, Deborah, went with her just to let, just to let me know, I know that we'd arrived there safely. My mum came back from this phone call crying and my dad said, whatever's the matter? She said, that plane crash. She said, the two Dorothys and Auntie Annie were on it. And she said, I did ask her the question are they all right? And she said, no, no, they're not. And she said, I had to put the phone down and come away. And I'll always remember, my dad was standing up when she told him this, and he literally just flopped down on the bed. I don't mean lay down, just... Uh, yeah. And said, my God, this family must be jinxed. And that is, that is how, how I heard about it. Well, about uh, 2010, which was 40 years after the event, uh, the local paper sort of did, does so many years and I, I noticed it and I thought, oh yeah. And I thought, I wonder if there's anything anywhere now we have access to the internet, which I hadn't before that. So I started searching on the internet. At first I found a short piece on YouTube. Then that led me to Googling things and Wikipedia and, and all that. And the more I dug, the more I found out. And as uh, this happened, I really wanted to go to go there and pay my respects. I wanted to go and visit the grave to pay my respects. My daughter uh, said that she would come with me, yes, um, which we did. We, uh, we went to a place in Barcelona, Barcelona itself. Um, now the uh, cemetery is in a, a little village called Arbusias. And um, we were all over Barcelona trying to find how we could get to Arbusias. And by God, we made it. We did it. Yeah. So I did, I did pay my respects. Very emotional to do that. Because when you find out something when you're 12 years old, which I was at the time, it was sad then. But 
when you're 12 years old, it doesn't give you the same impact. You're not quite as aware of how bad it was. And I have found out how bad it was. The plane carried seven crew and 105 passengers, so all in all there were 112 people killed. It was the deadliest aviation accident in 1970, and it remains the worldwide deadliest aviation accident involving a de Havilland Comet. Now, the pilot made contact with Barcelona Air Traffic Control. He was told to make a left turn. Then the pilot said the aircraft was passing the Sabadell outlying beacon, on which he said he heard it ping. Barcelona Approach acknowledged this and told them to descend to 2,800 feet. Unfortunately, Barcelona Radar had picked up another aircraft which flew over Sabadell at the same time. So they assumed that was the plane. A few minutes later, Barcelona Approach requested the aircraft altitude. The response was 4,000 feet. No further responses were made. The plane crashed between 18.05 and 18.06 hours in daylight, 3,800 feet up on the northeast, northeast slopes of Agudas Peach in the Sierra del Monsene, 65 kilometres northeast of Barcelona Airport, which was covered by a cloud due to a phenomenon known as barrage effect. Barrage cloud is a very thick, heavy cloud. Now, what I'm going to read out next is it gets quite grim in places, so this is just a bit of a warning. <laughs> Arthur Larkman, who is a Dano pilot, remembers the whole tragic event vividly. This is his words. Bob Atkins and I flew to Barcelona that night and when we arrived at the crash site, we thought there was inadequate security. With the help of the British Consul in Barcelona, who assisted us greatly, we were able to persuade the Guardia Civil to increase the 24-hour guard around the site to deter looters and souvenir hunters. The point of impact was on the side of a very steep mountain slope. Apparently, the pilot had seen the mountain at the last minute, because it appeared that the aircraft was in a nose-up altitude when it hit. Although the initial impact gouged a large section of the hillside away, the forward part of the fuselage and the cockpit had cut a wide sway through the trees for two to three hundred yards up the mountain. Due to the uneven terrain, a bulldozer and excavator shovels had to be used to widen paths and open up a new one, to facilitate evacuation of the victims. Since the Spanish health authorities reported that it was technically impossible for the remains of the bodies to be embalmed and preserved due to the extreme mutilation and scattering of the remains as a result of injuries of exceptional violence caused by an explosive shock wave and that death was presumably instantaneous in every case, the court ordered the bodies be removed and taken to the municipal cemetery of Arbusius, where they were buried. Bob and I examined the wreckage to gain an initial picture of what had happened and gathered up as much as we could locate of the documents, navigation logs, logbooks, etc., many of which were blood-stained. Most of the bodies had been removed by this time, but there were still many body parts scattered about some even hanging on tree branches. Bob carried on at the site and had to continue to endure the grisly and malodorous experience while I drove to the ATC centre in Barcelona. I was fortunate enough to persuade the ATC officials to give me a copy of the voice tape of the pilot's communication with ACT up to the time of the crash. With this valuable information, plus the navigation log, Back in London, I was able to plot the course of events, and this seemed to exonerate the crew. Um, well, it sort of struck me that it had been in the local newspapers at the time. Mm. So I went to the uh, 
archives in Lee and um, there they looked for me and they found some in the uh, from the local newspaper so I got those printed, printed off <laughs> so that helped and also I asked my dad because obviously he was the one who, who said it was um, a jinx the family's jinxed and he was able to provide me with a lot of valuable information because I couldn't remember actually that we were staying in Fairford in Gloucester. I knew we were staying somewhere, and that and that's where he was able to tell me that we were stay, staying in Fairford. And the reason we booked Fairford because of the American aircraft may have been uh, there. Yeah, and he was he was able to 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 tell me quite a lot of things and about uh, the. The people who died and um, the families and sto and stories about them as well. Yeah, yeah. But when I talked to him about the crash, he said, the funny thing is, he said, it didn't really hit me until months later. He said, I know it was like the initial shock, but he said it, it only started sinking in months later. And he said it was probably because my mother had died the month before. So he said it like I said the, the initial the initial shock, but then actual thinking about it, yeah, only happened, only happened months later. Well, we used to go uh, and visit them every Christmas. I think it was probably Boxing Day or something like that. It wasn't exactly Christmas Day, but it was around Christmas. And we always went, there was my mum, dad, me and my sister Deborah, <laughs> and um, my nan and granddad, that's uh, my mum's parents. So, well, we all used to go uh, around all together. And um, they were so nice. They were really, I know it's a very dated word these days, but they were nice. They were. And I always remember, uh, you know, the ba Battenberg cake with, um, not the little Battenberg slices you get these days, cake bars, a proper one that you cut, cut into slices. I said to Auntie Dorothy George, she's the one who's my godmother, I'm going to eat the yellow sponge first because I like the pink sponge best and I'm going to save that till last. And she said, ah. But you might not have enough room for the <laughs> for the pink sponge. <laughs> and every time I have a Battenberg cake, I always think of that. I know it sounds odd, sort of associating your godmother with a Battenberg cake, but it was it, it just stuck in my mind that yeah. But in a way, it keeps her memory alive, you know, even if it's only a piece of cake. Yeah, and like I say again, they were very nice people. Auntie Dorothy King, she was the other Dorothy. She was actually uh, the daughter of um, the Reverend King. He was a minister at the at Lee Baptist Church. And he, became, he actually became mayor of Lee. And I actually have his Mayor's Medal now, it was passed down to me. He asked Dorothy George to marry him. But, unfortunately, and she had a wedding dress and everything, he died before they could be married. So, it's all sort of uh, intertwined and that, and that is basically how Dorothy King went to live with Dorothy George and her seven. You may all be familiar with the uh, television series Sharp, uh, starring Sean Bean as um, Richard Sharp. You may not have watched it, but maybe most of you are familiar with the song Over the Hills and Far Away. That was the theme song. There's a verse in that song which strikes a particular chord with me. Though I may travel far from Spain, a part of me shall still remain, and you are with me night and day, and over the hills and far away.